Ali Kojia, merchant of Baghdad. In the reign of Harun al-Rashid, there lived in Baghdad a merchant named Ali Kojia, who, having neither wife nor child, contented himself with the modest, modest profits produced by his trade. He had spent some years quite happily in the house his father had left him, when, three nights running, he dreamed that an old man had appeared to him and had reproached him for having neglected the duty of a good Muslim in delaying so long his pilgrimage to Mecca. Ali Kodia was so troubled by this dream, as he was unwilling to give up his shop and lose all his customers. He shut his eyes for some time to the necessity of performing this pilgrimage, and had tried to con atone to his conscience by an extra number of good works. But this dream seemed to him a direct warning, and he resolved to put off the journey no longer. The first thing he did was to sell his furniture and the wares he had in his shop, only reserving to himself such goods as he might trade with on the road. The shop itself he sold also, and easily found a tenant for his private home. The only matter he could not settle satisfactorily was the safe custody of a thousand pieces of gold which he lift, wished to leave behind him. After some thought, Alakogia hit upon a plan which seemed to him a safe one. He took a large vase and, placing the money in the bottom of it, filled the rest with olives. After corking the vase tightly, he carried it to one of his friends, a merchant like himself, and said to him, My brother, you have probably heard that I am starting with a caravan in a few days for Mecca. I have come to ask whether you would do me the favour to keep this vase of olives for me till I come back. The merchant replied readily, Look, this is the key of my shop. Take it and put the vase wherever you like. I promise that you will find it in the same place on your return. A few days later, Ali Kojia mounted the camel that he had laden with merchandise, joined the caravan and arrived in due time at Mecca. Like the other pilgrims, he visited the sacred mosque and after all his religious duties were performed, he set out his goods to the best advantage, hoping to gain some customers among the passers-by. Very soon two merchants stopped, and when they had turned over the goods, one said to the other, If this man was wise, he would take these things to Cairo, where he would get a much better price than is likely here. Ali Kojia heard the words, and lost no time in following the advice. He picked up his wares, and instead of returning to Baghdad, joined a caravan that was going to Cairo. The results of the journey gladdened his heart. He sold everything almost directly, and bought a large stock of Egyptian curiosities, which he intended selling at Damascus. But the caravan with which he would have to travel would not be starting for another six weeks, so he took advantage of the delay to visit the pyramids and some of the cities along the banks of the Nile. Now the attractions of Damascus so fascinated the worthy Ali, he could hardly tear himself away. But at length, he remembered he had a home in Baghdad. He would return by way of Aleppo, and, after he had crossed the Euphrates, follow the course of the Tigris. But when he reached Mosul, Ali had made friends with some Persian merchants, and they persuaded him to accompany them to their native land, and even as far as India. And so it came to pass that seven years had slipped by since he had left Baghdad. And during all that time, the friend with whom he had left the vase of olives had never once thought of him or it. In fact, it was only a month before Ali Kojia's actual return that the affair came into his head at all, owing to his wife's remarking one day that it was a long time since she'd eaten any, any olives and she would like some. That reminds me, said the husband, before Ali Kojia went to Mecca seven years ago, he left a vase of olives in my care. But really, by this time, he must be dead, and there's no reason why we should not eat the olives if we like. Give me a light, and I will fetch them, and see how they taste. My husband, replied the wife, beware, I pray, of you doing anything so base. Supposing seven years have passed without news of Ali Kojia, he need not be dead for all that, and may come back any day. How shameful would it be to have to confess you have betrayed your trust and broken the seal of the vase. Pay no attention to my idle wor words. I really have no desire for olives now, and probably after all this while they are no longer good. I have a presentiment that Ali Kojia will return, and what will he think of you? Give it up, I entreat. The merchant, however, refused to listen to her advice, sensible though it was. 
he took a light and a dish and went into his shop. If you will be so obstinate, said his wife, I cannot help it, but do not blame me if it turns out ill. When the merchant opened the vase, he found the topmost olives were rotten, and in order to see if the under ones were in better condition, he shook some out into the dish. As they fell out, a few of the gold pieces fell out too. The sight of the money roused all the merchant's greed. He looked into the vase and saw that all the bottom was filled with gold. He then replaced the olives and returned to his wife. My wife, he said as he entered the room, you were quite right, the olives were rotten and I've recorked the vase so well that Alicogia will never know that it's been touched. You would have done better to believe me, replied the wife. I trust that no harm will come of it. These words made no impression on the, the merchant, made no more impression on the merchant than the others had done and he spent the whole night in wondering how he could manage to keep the gold if Alicogia should come back and claim his vase. Very early the next morning he went out and bought fresh new olives. Then he threw away the old ones, took out the gold and hid it, and filled up the vase with the olives he had bought. This done, he recorked the vase and put it back in the same place where it had been left by Alicogia. A month later, Alicogia re-entered Baghdad, and as his house was still let, he went to an inn. The following day, he set out to see his friend, the merchant, who received him with open arms and many expressions of surprise. After a few moments given to inquiries, Alicogia begged the merchant to hand him over the vase that he had taken care of for so long. Oh, certainly, said he. I am only glad I could be of use to you in the matter. Here is the key of my shop. You will find the vase in the place where you put it. Ali Kojia fetched the vase and carried it through to his room at the inn where he opened it. He thrust down his hand but could feel no money, but still he was persuaded it must be there. So he emptied out the olives, to no purpose. The gold was not there. He was dumb with horror. Then, lifting up his hands, he exclaimed, can my old friend really have committed such a crime? In great haste, he went back to the house of the merchant. My friend, he cried, you will be astonished to see me again, but I can find nowhere in this vase the thousand pieces of gold I placed in the bottom under the olives. Perhaps you may have taken a loan of them for your business purposes. If that is you're, so, you are most welcome. I will only ask that you give me a receipt and you can repay the money at your leisure. The merchant, who had expected something of the sort, had his reply all ready. Alicogia, he said, when you brought me the vase of olives, did I ever touch it? I gave you the key of my shop and you put it yourself where you liked. And did you not find it in exactly the same spot and in the same state? If you placed any gold in it, it must be there still. I know nothing about that. You only told me that there were olives. You can believe me or not, but I have not laid a finger on that vase. Ali Kogia has tried every means to persuade the merchant to admit the truth. I love peace, he said, and I shall deeply regret having to so resort to harsh measures. Once more, think of your reputation. I shall be in despair if you oblige me to call in the aid of the law. Ali Kogia, answered the merchant, you allow that it was a vase of olives you placed in my charge. You fetched it and you removed it yourself. And now you tell me it contained a thousand pieces of gold and that I must restore them to you? Did you ever say anything about them before? Why, I did not even know the vase had olives in it. You never showed them to me. I wonder you have not demanded pearls or diamonds. Retire, I pray you, lest a crowd should gather in front of my shop. By this time, not only the casual passers-by, but also the neighbouring merchants were standing around, listening to the dispute, and, every, and trying every now and then to soothe matters between them. But at the merchant's last words, Ali Kogia resolved to lay the cause of the quarrel before them and told them the whole story. They heard him to the end and inquired of the merchant what he had to say. The accused man admitted that he had kept Ali Kogia's vase in his shop, but he denied having touched it and swore that as to what it contained, he only knew what Ali Kogia had told him calling them all to witness the insult that had been put upon him. You have brought it on yourself, said Ali Kogia, taking him by the arm, 
and as you appeal to the law, the law you shall have. Let us see if you will dare repeat your story before the Kadi. Now, as a good Muslim, the, magician, the merchant was forbidden to refuse this choice of a judge, and so he accepted the test and said to Ali Kodia, Very well, I should like nothing better. We shall soon see which one of us is in the right. So the two men presented themselves before the Kadi, and Ali Kodia again repeated his tale. The Kadi asked what, the, what witnesses he had. Ali Kodia replied that he had not taken this precaution, as he had considered the man his friend and up till that time had always found him honest. The merchant, on his side, stuck to his story and offered to swear solemnly that not only had he never, had he never stolen the thi- thousand gold pieces, but that he did not even know that they were there. The Kadi allowed him to take the oath and pronounced him innocent. Ali Kodia, furious at having to suffer such a loss, protested against the verdict declaring that he would appeal to the Caliph Harun al-Rashid himself. But the Qadi paid no attention to his threats and was quite satisfied that he had done what was right. Judgment being given, the merchant returned home triumphant and Ali Kodia went back to his inn to draw up a petition to the Caliph. The next morning he placed himself on the road along which the Caliph must pass after midday prayer and stretched out his petition to the officer who walked before the Caliph whose duty it was to collect such things, and on entering the palace, to hand them to his master. There, Harun al-Rashid studied them carefully. <clears throat> Knowing this custom, Ali Kodia followed the caliph into the public hall of the palace and awaited the result. After some time, the officer appeared and told him that the caliph had read his petition and had appointed an hour the next morning to give him an audience. He then inquired the merchant's address, so that he might be summoned to attend also. That very evening, the caliph, his grand vizier Giafar, and Mesrul, chief of all the eunuchs, all three disguised as was their habit, went out to take a stroll through the town. Going down one street, the caliph's attention was attracted by a noise, and looking through a door which opened into into a court, he perceived ten or twelve children playing in the moonlight. He hid himself in a dark corner and watched them. Let us play at being the Kiddi, said the brightest and quickest of them all. I will be the Kiddi. Bring before me Ali Kodia and the merchant who robbed him of the thousand pieces of gold. The boy's words recalled to the caliph the petition he had read this morning, and he waited with interest to see what the children would do. The proposal was hailed with joy by the other children, who had heard a great deal of talk about the matter and they quickly settled the part each was to play. The Kadi took his seat gravely, and an officer introduced first Alicogia, the plaintiff, and then the merchant, who was the defendant. Alicogia made a low bow and pleaded his case point by point, concluding by imploring the Kadi not to inflict on him such a heavy loss. The Kadi, having heard his case, turned to the merchant and inquired why he had not repaid Alicogia the sum in question. The boy merchant repeated the reasons the real merchant had given to the Kadi of Baghdad and also offered to swear that he had told the truth. Stop a moment, said the little Kadi. Before we come to oaths, I should like to examine the vase with the olives. Ali Kodia, he added, have you the vase with you? Finding he had not, the Kadi continued, go and get it and bring it back to me. So Ali Kodia disappeared for an in- instant and then pretended to lay a vase at the feet of the Kadi, declaring that it was his vase, which he had given to the accused for safe custody. And in order to be quite correct, the Kadi asked the merchant if he recognised it as the same vase. By his silence, the merchant admitted the fact, and the Kadi then commanded to have the vase opened. Alicogia made a movement as if he was taking off the lid, and the little Kadi on his part made a pretense of peering into the vase. What beautiful olives, he said, I should like to taste one. And pretending to put one in his mouth, he added, they are really excellent. But, he went on, it seems to me odd that olives seven years old should be as good as that. Send for some dealers in olives and let us hear what they say. Two children were presented to him as olive merchants and the Kadi addressed them. 
Tell me, he said, how long can olives be kept so as to be pleasant eating? My lord, replied the merchants, however much care is taken to preserve them, they never last beyond the third year. They lose both taste and colour and are only fit to be thrown away. If that is so, answered the little kiddie, examine this vase and tell me how long the olives have been in it. The olive merchants pretended to examine the olives and taste them, and then reported to the Kadi that they were fresh and good. You are mistaken, said he. Ali Kojia declares he put them in that vase seven years ago. My lord, re returned the olive merchants, we can assure you that the olives are those of the present year, and if you consult all the merchants in Baghdad, you will not find one to give a contrary opinion. The accused merchant opened his mouth, mouth as if to protest, but the Kadi gave him no time. Be silent, he said. You are a thief. Take him away and hang him. So the game ended, the children clapping their hands in applause and leading the criminal away to be hanged. Harun al-Rashid was lost in astonishment at the wisdom of the child, who had given so wise a verdict on the case which he himself was to hear on the morrow. Is there any other verdict possible? he asked the Grand Vizier who was as much impressed as himself. I can imagine no better judgment. If the circumstances are really such as we have heard, replied the Grand Vizier, it seems to me your highness could only follow the example of the boy in this method of reasoning and also in your conclusions. Then take no careful note of this house, said the Caliph, and bring me the boy tomorrow that the affair might be tried by him in my presence. Summon also the Kadi to learn his duty from the mouth of a child. Bid Alakogia bring his vase of olives and see that two dealers of olives are present. So saying, the caliph returned to the palace. The next morning early, the Grand Vizier went back to the house where they had seen the children playing and asked for the mistress and her children. Three boys appeared and, in, and the Grand Vizier inquired which had represented the Kadi in their game of the previous evening. The eldest and tallest, changing colour, confessed that it was he, and to his mother's great alarm, the Grand Vizier said that he had strict orders to bring him into the presence of the Caliph. Does he want to take my son from me? cried the poor woman. The Grand Vizier hastened to calm her, assuring her that she should have the boy again in an hour, and she would be quite satisfied when she knew the reason for the summons. So she dressed the boy in his best clothes, and the two left the house. When the Grand Vizier presented the child to the Caliph, he was a little old and confused, and Harun al-Rashid proceeded to explain why he had sent for him. A prench, my son, he said. I think it was you who judged the case of Ali Kodia and the merchant last night. I overheard you by chance, and was very pleased with the way you conducted the trial. Today you will see the real Ali Kodia and the real merchant. Seat yourself at once next to me. The caliph being seated on his throne, with the boy next to him, the parties to the suit were ushered in. One by one they prostrated themselves and touched the carpet at the foot of the throne with their foreheads. When they rose up, the caliph said, Now speak. This child will give you justice, and if more should be wanted, I will see to it myself. Alikogia and the merchant pleaded one after the other, but when the merchant offered to swear the same oath that he had taken before the Kadi, he was stopped by the child who said that before this was done, he must first see the vase of olives. At these words, Ali Kogia presented the vase to the Caliph and uncovered it. The Caliph took one of the olives, tasted it, and ordered the expert merchants to do the same. They pronounced the olives good and fresh that year. The boy informed them that Ali Kogia declared it was seven years since he had placed them in the jar, to which they returned the same answer as the children had done. The accused merchant saw by this time that his condemnation was certain, and tried to allege something in his defence. The boy had too much sense to order him to be hanged, and looked at the caliph, saying, Commander of the faithful, this is not a game now. It is for your highness to condemn him, and not for me. Then the caliph, convinced that the man was a thief, bade them take him away and hang him, which was done, but not before he had confessed his guilt and the place in which he had hidden Ali Kogia's money. The caliph ordered the Kadi to learn how to deal out justice from the mouth of a child, 
and sent the boy home with a purse containing a hundred pieces of gold as a mark of his favour. See you tomorrow.